so um I basically you and I have known each other for like it feels like a year now right yeah um, yeah for a year at least yeah and we are both kind of like it feels like we're both kind of up and coming around the same time and yeah. um you've been way better at this than me <laughs> that's an objective objective no, truth. I don't think so I don't think so I think you've been excellent with this you're very good at what you do so thank you please tell my parents um but uh I honestly like yeah your work ethic is something that I've always admired the fact that you stream every day I get so exhausted from every stream um so I, I've always yeah. found that kind of crazy that you managed <laughs> to do it yeah I I have um I have like a workaholic syndrome uh, kind of so so it's uh where do you think yeah, that comes think, from I think it runs in the family I think my mom was a workaholic my brother is a workaholic um I and I think um I, I feel like uh you know one thing that I always like was taught growing up like if you work hard enough you will be successful um and uh yeah it's always kind of been like that even to my detriment at times so yeah do you feel like you found success, right, in having, like, such a good amount of viewership and being so, like, steady as a streamer? I think so. I think I still feel like I, I have more to do and I have more stuff to, to figure out and to kind of um, – I, I don't know that I'm that successful yet. I, I think that I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm happy with where I've come, but I still feel like I have a long way to go. Why did you choose the name Stardust, by the way? It was like a username that I typed into um into a like forum when I was like 24 I think and it just kind of stuck ever since. So Do you remember when I, Do you remember when I told you that you should um wear like you should embrace like the stardust theme where you should like do your makeup with like crazy sparkles and all of that shit? I, yeah, and you know it's funny I did do it for a while. Um I just feel like if I'm talking to people like like um spencer or if i'm talking i don't know if i'm talking to like these people who are pretty big right-wing figures i feel like i can't do the sparkles you know um, Can you imagine how you're otherwise like, I, you're trying to yeah. like humanize yourself and you're covered in like silver sparkles <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah but probably not the best advice um but yeah that makes sense okay um i so first i think a lot of people don't know a lot about you right like they don't know um uh especially people who have criticisms right like maybe mm -hmm. I, i'm sure like some people just see you as a destiny orbiter or um i get call, i've caught being called out again uh, my, myself um yeah or uh i don't know i like um i'm sure like you've been labeled a bunch of criticisms but a lot of people don't know like where you come from and kind of like what makes you come to these conclusions that people have criticisms for and I just I really wanted to focus on that um, especially at the beginning so like could you tell me a bit about kind of um, like what it was like for you growing up where you grew up um, and like all of that yeah I grew up in the DC area um, grew up in uh, like a, I'm obviously of Indian origin I think it's pretty hard for people to miss um, my family was kind of traditional but also non-traditional in another way um is your family I, muslim or hindu my family is muslim yeah okay. um but pretty you know my mom and my brother are pretty liberal um uh my my extended family tends to be pretty liberal but you know there are people in our community who can be very um traditional mm -hmm. um and my family dynamic already wasn't typical because when I was like six, I think my mom and my dad uh, got divorced. Um, and so that's a highly, highly uncommon. Mm -hmm. in, I was going to say India. that's sure. that's pretty yeah. rare. Yeah, it's pretty taboo uh, in Indian and in Muslim culture. Um, so uh, but it was for the right reasons. Um, my my dad wasn't like the best person and our lives significantly improved um after the divorce uh so um he was still kind of in and out of my life um and i think i finally kind of like stopped talking to him when i turned 18 i stopped taking his calls as much um oh, wow. i started to take it his calls less and less over the years and now i think it's been like 
um, maybe like six years since I've talked to him. Um, so, uh, but I mean, yeah, my life significantly improved, um, you know, the more I distanced myself from that. So it, it's like I came from a kind of traditional culture, but my family kind of stuck out because we didn't really fall into that role um, very well. Did you ever feel like because of the stigma associated with like your parents' divorce and stuff that did you ever feel like somewhat ostracized from like the Muslim community or like the South Asian Muslim community? I felt like because people knew my mom, they understood, but there was still always a little bit of a stigma around it. It, it, it certainly was non-traditional and I did feel like um, I, I did feel like judged for it, even though it wasn't my fault, even though it wasn't her fault. Um, it, you know, it wasn't any of our faults. Um, uh, it, you know, it was, it was his fault. Um, but we still felt, I, I still felt like I was judged for it. I still felt like, um, I also felt, so my dad was like very, very ill, very, um, uh, I think, he, I think he was like, on top of just being like a psychopath, I think he was, um, he had like schizoaffective disorder. Um, oh, and yeah. And so, um, so when we did, my mom still wanted my brother and I to maintain contact with him because she didn't want to be seen as one of those mothers who gets divorced and then poisons their children against their father. Mm -hmm. But really take her saying anything uh, about him for us to already be terrified of him um uh mm -hmm. so i don't think um when we lived together i don't think there was um i, I don't think we ever felt safe with him um I, I i think my earliest memory um of my dad is like we were at the beach and he was holding me under the water and um and i was uh screaming and crying because i couldn't breathe um oh my god Sorry, you didn't mean to get so dark no, so quickly. No, like, oh, um, yeah, we should probably put a um, a, a trigger yeah. or like a content warning. Yeah. We're going to be yeah, talking sorry. about abuse and stuff, but uh, yeah, feel uh, please continue as long as you're comfortable. Um, yeah, that yeah. sounds um, so, terrifying. Yeah, yeah. So that's like my earliest memory of my um, of my uh, of my dad, which should probably like indicate like we never really felt safe around him. Um, even after the divorce, um, she still wanted us to kind of keep contact with him. Um, uh, and so, so we did, he would come and visit, but because of his illness and because of just who he is, he would make a scene wherever we went. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, if like he took us out to like a restaurant or something, he would inevitably make a scene in the restaurant. Um, and you know, we felt embarrassed by it. And obviously mm -hmm. like the restaurant people would know that, um, it wasn't our fault. Um, but they would be mad at him. And, uh, so even visiting him was, uh, nerve wracking because you didn't really know what he was going to do. Um, and, um, he, he was also like very like emotionally manipulative, um, of my brother us uh, especially i think i was kind of a little bit more um disconnected from him but he would do or say things that would specifically get my brother upset and that would get me really upset with him um that would get me really angry with him um and Did it was like, my older brother was so, he like yeah. manipulating your brother like against your family or something or was it more targeting no, him he would say he would say things like he would say things to kind of provoke us. Right. Like he would say that, like, um, like your mom's a whore. Um, or like he would say something like really, uh, um, uh, he would say like, um, he would come up with these really weird narratives that like, um, that she was in contact with like the Royal family or something like that. And, um, and obviously that's like the illness, but him calling her a whore, um, when he was like also cheating, like throughout the marriage, um, was, you know, uh, ridiculous, you know? So, yeah. Uh, classic so, projection. Yeah. Classic projection. Yeah. Um, 
which by the way, I don't think she ever saw anybody, um, uh, outside of my dad. Um, but, uh, so yeah, like, um, so, so it was, it was, it was kind of weird, um, uh, kind of like growing up with somebody who was so unstable, somebody who we were all, we always felt unsafe around. Um, luckily, you know, they did get divorced because my mom noticed it was affecting us. Um, it did feel weird being kind of like stigmatized, being kind of like feeling like I didn't quite fit in, feeling like I couldn't really talk about my dad um, whenever mm. my friends brought him up. Um, like, where's your dad? What's your dad up to? Um, eventually, he moved to Texas, I think. Um, uh, and he would come and visit every once in a while. But yeah, uh, it, it was it was very strange. For a long time, I couldn't really talk about him openly. Um, uh, I don't know why. I, I just felt like he was this secret that I had to like uh, kind of bury. So. So do you yeah. think that that was more of like Western cultures focus, especially like it's only recently that people have been talking openly about mental health and abuse and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but like then there's also another layer that you're also dealing with being like in the South Asian Muslim community. So do you think yeah. it was both of those things or I think it was a little one? bit of both. I think it was a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds insanely tough. It sounds like your childhood specifically is like super unstable. Um, like the what really struck me is like that you of what you said is that you're just in like this constant fear of like, what's the next thing he's going to do? Like, it's just he's unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. I have to give my mom credit because she worked very hard um, to give us like everything we needed growing up. Um, but there is still always this um, kind of shadow kind of hanging over me. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I, I felt like a, my dad was like a secret I couldn't talk about. Um, uh, and I couldn't talk about him with anybody, um, uh, whether that was like friends at school or if that was people in, in the South Asian community. Um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, he was just, um, this huge secret in my life for the longest time. Your mom um, sounds amazing that first of all, that mm -hmm. she was brave enough to leave in a situation like that when it's so hard for women in her situation to do that. Right. And I'm guessing, yeah. I'm guessing a huge part of that was probably her affection for, you know, for you and your siblings to, mm -hmm. um, to leave. So that, that sounds, yeah. So you do have a good relationship with your mom, like still to this I day? I do. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Um, she was very strict with us growing up, but I don't think I would have had it any other way, you know? So, yeah. Honestly, it sounds stuff. really, at least, yeah. <laughs> at least that's yeah. good. Um, so I know that, like, you also, did you grow up primarily in a South Asian kind of community um, or was it really diverse? It was really diverse. Um, well, actually, I think my my hometown was pretty conservative, actually. Um, up until recent years. Um, now it's very liberal. But um, growing up like early on, it was a pretty conservative town. Um, and obviously, like when you're um, like if your parents an immigrant, you, you've got like a kind of like a network of other people who are mm -hmm. from the same culture um, or from similar cultures who will like meet up. And so um, so there was always like um, every Every once in a while, we would go to like a South Asian function at somebody's house and um, and it was like a South Asian like Muslim function. So, yeah, that's cool. Did you like um, did you experience like any kind of racism or discrimination like at all? Uh, probably like right after 9-11, there was a significant amount. Um, uh, yeah, so right after 9-11, there was a significant amount of, of discrimination, I think my my mom had um, people ask her in the grocery store why she was a terrorist, you know, like, oh my God. Um, she'd be like, no, nah, I'm not a terrorist. Um, uh, I had people at school ask me um, really weird questions along those same lines. My brother in, uh, was in high school at the time, and he had like a group of kids come up to him and tell him he was going to go to hell if he didn't convert. Um, uh, stuff like that. So like immediately after 9-11, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. Um, especially we were in the DC area. Um, so 
Yeah. Yeah. So people are particularly patriotic there, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. And even then we would go to like these functions and then people would talk about like, uh, like we knew, um, we, like we knew that like there was monitoring and that all of us were like under suspicion and all that. And like, we would hear stories about like some aunt who, uh, whose son was named, um, who was first, whose son's first name was Osama basically. <laughs> Mm-hmm. and who would get questioned and so um i mean like imagine like the unfortunate uh how unfortunate you have to be to have the first name osama yeah. but um yeah <laughs> so and we would hear stories like that um but uh yeah for, for the most part um it kind of eased up as years came went on but yeah significant like there was a significant amount of like racism and discrimination and weariness around us uh right after 9-11 so was there ever a curiosity that you had like um about why they thought these things and why people were so like discriminatory I don't I don't think there was a curiosity I think I understood it um because I remember the the day that that happened um I remember going home and I was by myself at home um and I remember watching the news and being horrified at what was happening in the news. So mm-hmm. I was just as scared as any other American. So was my mom. So was my brother. Um, yeah, all of us were just as scared as other Americans were. So we understood where they were coming from, why they were the way that they were. We just wished that there could have been some more understanding. Um, I mean, I have my criticisms of of Islam, but that's not really around like um, that specifically. Um, so, yeah. Um, the uh, the criticism that you have of Islam, like, do you want to kind of like, do, would you be able to summarize it a bit or? Sure. Anything? I think it I think it's similar to a lot of religions in that a lot of religions put women in a secondary status. And I don't think that 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 like I, I'm not denying that there's like a, you know, reality that sometimes women are just more drawn to certain things than men are. but. I do think that there, um, I, th- I don't think that means that we should be secondary. And I do think specifically Islam, um, like I always thought it weird when my mom and I would see women who would like wear the burqa or the niqab. Um, like there's no way I can look at that and not see that as like inherently oppressive. Um, it's something that's separating you from your peers is making you stand out like a sore thumb like the hijab i have no problem with that's something i think you know a lot of people can like blend into society and assimilate into society with that but the niqab and the burqa are very much yeah they, uh, they like cover your face right yeah um, not just yeah. your hair and that's what makes yeah. them particularly unique yeah and and it's a, like a barrier like anybody would you know if, if you can't it, it, it it's just a barrier to it, to integration really um so i think that i i don't know i just think that the there's no way i can look at the burqa or the niqab and not say that it is inherently oppressive towards women so your family is originally from india right mm-hmm. um yeah. when did they like were your parents immigrants or were their grandparents immigrants um so my parents were immigrants. Yeah. Um, Do you know my dad, where they came? Uh, so my dad's family came to America first. Um, and, um, and then when he married my mom, she, she came over. Um, essentially, that's pretty much it. So. Uh, oh, wow. I, that, not- that adds like so many layers to. I don't know if. I don't think you use the term abuse, right? Um, but uh, it adds so many layers to the situation that your mom. Um, was in yeah she's like in this new country as well dealing yeah, with she was in an yeah. arranged marriage as well um she knew that like the only way out of her situation was to to kind of like go with this and she did and then my dad ended up being like the worst possible person to be in an arranged marriage with so yeah um yeah I'm often not against the idea of arranged marriages but like they can definitely go south in situations like yeah this. some some arranged marriages do work out really well, like especially if the family, the both families are meeting and there are no red flags and 
and you know, you would trust your family to find somebody who would be good to you. Um, Mm -hmm. but sometimes you just can't predict things. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, the reason why I was asking you earlier, like about the, um, about like why you're curious, um, about like why people were being discriminatory and all that stuff with you, um, is, uh, it kind of connects to, I think probably the main criticism I've seen, um, of you, which has to do with like the drama that happened recently, mm-hmm. um, which is about the, like, about, you know, your so-called associations. Um, so like, Mr. Girl or Flamenco or um, I don't know, like, I don't I, I've heard other associations. I can't remember their name. Um, so I have yeah. no clue even, even if that's true. Uh, and so um, I guess like one of the theories that I had, because I don't know you insanely well, but from what I know, you seem like honestly and incredibly, and I'm saying this genuinely, like you honestly seem like, first of all, incredibly brave. Like you say things and do things that I genuinely admire, um, even when you know that you'll get pushed back against it, uh, like last mm-hmm. week with the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp situation. Um, mm-hmm. And I also know that you're an incredibly compassionate person. So like, I guess I was trying to rationalize in my head, like why, um, why would you, I don't know, say these nice things about um, people that I consider well, like say like with Mr. Girl that I consider I really don't don't like uh, his ideas or anything. And I'm like, why would you like them? Um, so the way I was kind of like rationalizing it in my head, um, and you can tell me if this is true or not, uh, is that it's like your way of trying to understand why they hold these, you know, well, these weird views that you personally have been harmed by. Um, like say like with flamenco, right? Because he's, he's been associated with like Nazi ideology and all that stuff. I mean, yeah. I also think that like, I don't think anybody is, is past the point of redemption. Um, so I don't want to ever isolate somebody from, um, from having like friendship and things like that. I think that goes a long way. Uh, I think flamenco, like, um, like, obviously, he's got a history. Um, he has a past that's, like, not the best. He used to be a co-host of Killstream. Um, but mm-hmm. him and Ethan Ralph are, like, virtually enemies now. Um, he's still pretty conservative, I would say. Still, He's still, like, I think he's, like, a paleocon or something like that. But, um, but are they enemies because he really disagreed with all of Ethan Ralph's dangerous ideology? And just for people who don't know, like, um, Ethan Ralph, like, he... Uh, participated in like revenge porn um and yeah he doesn't he doesn't like that about him he's an open anti-semite like this guy is like he's just like a neo-nazi like basically so um, uh so uh i don't i don't know much about um about ethan ralph i know that flamenco and him got into fights over like uh, um like the ethics of some of the stuff that that he did um I think, um, I mean, one that one thing that was really funny to me is one of my earliest interactions with Ethan, uh, Ralph and, and Flamenco, actually, uh, like very early on in our friendship is um, Ethan Ralph, I think, tried to like cancel Flamenco for like respecting people's pronouns, which was like the funniest thing on earth to me. So, I mean, like, oh, I think um, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, Flamenco so, believes in respecting people's pronouns. That's yes, genu- uh, surprising. Yeah, yeah, he does. So, um so people would be surprised at a lot of things by these people. Um like um like Flamenco, he's he's like a paleocon, but like he will um I I'm pretty sure he has like trans people in his audience, you know. I'm pretty sure he um he like for the most part I've seen is uh, you know, pretty respectful with people's pronouns. He did make videos about Keffels around the time that Destiny was banned because he's part of the community on YouTube that is very opposed to um, false flagging um, uh, and getting people um, uh, falsely like removed from platforms. Um, on YouTube, there's a huge culture around that. They hate that. Um, so uh, so I think he did make some stuff about her. He ha- And he has done some things like I'm not going to like deny that he's done some things that are, you know, a little bit unhinged in the past. 
And and like people will tell him, you know, his friends will tell him like, hey, that like there was like a whole uh, there was like a whole intervention recently that people had with him. Or I don't know about recently, but like um, some time back. Um, but um, where they were like, don't do this thing. You sound unhinged, uh, which was, you know, um, and he takes those things into consideration. Um, I'm not I'm, I'm just not willing to completely ostracize somebody. Um, uh, and, and he's somebody who's kind of like, um, you know, stuck up for me as well. Um, uh, and we have meaningful conversations when, when we do have deep conversations. So I, I don't know. I just, um, uh, you know, one thing growing up, um, I, I read like about like these terrorists who like took part in like 9-11. This is going to sound horrible. Um, but, um, I, I read about these terrorists who took part in it. And a lot of these people, like the ones that they would recruit from the West are, are men who were like isolated, who had nobody like um, around them, yeah. who were looking for like, um, like friendship and community and, um, and they didn't feel like they fit in. And then because they got discriminated against, they felt even more ostracized. And I think that isolation does a lot to a person and i'm not willing to isolate anybody um i think that i think that i the only time i'm willing to like really cut people off is when they are being destructive in my life um so i mean that's why i want to talk to people with different views i want to understand like where they're coming from i also want to humanize myself before them and and so they have to see me as a human and not like this caricature that's been painted for them the latter i completely understand like as a jewish woman as an asian woman like i completely understand the um this need to feel like no like we're not like what you think let me prove it you know like let Mm -hmm. me like, just get to know me and I'll change your mind. Um, and feeling like you kind of almost want to fall on the sword for it. Like, I, I totally understand that. Um, but, like, the stuff before is what I is, – is stuff that I still don't understand. The um, – like, just some of the stuff – again, again, a lot of the stuff is uh, – as many people on Twitter told me multiple times, it's hearsay. Um, because I, I am not a victim of flamenco so far myself. Um, so these are only things that I've heard. Um but I have heard them from people that I, I really trust. Uh, and so, like, for example, um, he uh, something that he he did was a hearsay um, is that uh, he harassed um, uh, Xander Thal and then contacted Xander's uh, Xander Thal's. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Probably. I'm well, terrible. OK, so uh, what happened with Xander his mom. Hall? Yeah. So what happened with Xander Hall is I think him and Xander Hall were fighting about something. And then, um, and Xander Hall was saying in a video that flamenco was all these horrible things. And then flamenco said, uh, basically threatened that he'll like call his mom basically. And, um, he didn't actually, um, partly because like YouTube, the YouTube community was like flamenco, like, don't do that. That's fucking unhinged. Um, uh, sorry, am I allowed to curse here? I didn't realize. No, uh, yeah, you can curse. <laughs> uh so you know um uh like uh flamenco don't do that that's what people who you don't like do uh so i mean i i'm not going to defend everything that he's done in the past um and uh, and i can't really speak to who he was before i was friends with him right but what i can say about the flamenco that i know uh now is that he's you know, he's a paleo con from what I can tell. He, um, he's pretty genuine. He's autistic. Um, he, uh, he likes anime. Uh, he follows VTuber drama for the most part. Uh, so that, I mean, these are like, I mean, that's kind of sketchy. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. so. Um, yeah. And he gets, and you know, he's like, he gets very upset when people are, um, making like a character of him that that isn't him um and uh and you know he feels like yeah he gets very upset by that and and understandably so because i i get the same way but um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna like defend everything that he's done um all i can say is that i'm not flamenco i am my own person um 
but I'm going to interact and continue to interact with the people that I interact with. And if I see them doing something bad, I'll discourage them from doing it. So. So, okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So yesterday, Flamenco, I think it was yesterday. Or the, yeah, it was yesterday. Um, he retweeted um, basically like complete misinformation about the Buffalo shooting. Um, he's since deleted the tweet to my knowledge, but uh, he like retweeted this thing about um, uh, about the Buffalo shooting actually being like a CIA plant. Um, oh God, dude. And it's like, I have friends, like I have a few friends that are, I guess I would call problematic that have views yeah. that I disagree with. I've in the past been associated with people. Like I've almost experienced a very similar thing to you, like where people just subscribed my views to like the men that were around me. Um, so I, I completely understand why that that's frustrating. Um, but uh, but yeah, so, but he retweeted that kind of stuff. Um, like what do you, um, when you find out about those types of behaviors, like, um, it feels like that stuff is, it's more than just, I don't know, like a friend just saying something that's a bit yikesy. Like it feels, um, especially when he's like a content creator and he's actively changing people's minds. Um, and you're a huge content creator and you're bringing him on publicly, like, um, like, how do you, like, what do you say to him in a situation like that? Do you try to like change his mind or do you just kind of, do you just ex accept that he's just, uh, he's just flamenco. That's just like what he does. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't even see that honestly. And I, I can't keep up with everything that he does. I think most people know that I'm like, like him and I have very opposing viewpoints on a lot of things. Uh, uh, like virtually, I think a lot of like all of our political views are like opposite of each other. Um, uh, but um, when it comes to stuff like that, like, yeah, I, I would push back on it in private with him, you know, but it seems like he already like deleted the tweet. Right. So somebody already corrected him or told him that like that's not really appropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's something that I would do in, in private, probably. But you wouldn't do it publicly? Um, I mean, I do it publicly when we're on a show together. But if it's like on on Twitter, I don't know. Like I can I can barely keep up with Twitter as it is. Um, so I didn't even notice that he tweeted something like that. But yeah, I would probably message him privately and say, like, hey, maybe you want to take that down. Is there something that he could do that would be like too much? Because like, I mean, what I just just described is somewhat minor. Um, but I don't know, say he, um, I don't know, like say he actually engaged in a hate crime or say he justified hate crime. Um, like, is there like a line in which you'd be like, I don't know if I want to publicly associate myself with this person anymore. Yeah. I mean, if he had gone through with like calling Xander Hall's mom, I would have been like, I thought um, he did call you know. Xander Hall's mom. Like I thought he did. No, try to he, he threatened, he threatened to, but he didn't actually, um, so if he did that, I, I would probably, you know, very, I don't know. I probably, it's, I would, you know, say that that's really cringe and I probably wouldn't associate with him as much, um, a, a, in a friendly manner, at least. Um, a lot of, a lot of also though, like the people that I talk to, I have more like of a coworker relationship with, um, or, or like an associate relationship with so flamenco is somebody i'm friends with but like there are a lot of people that um who have opposing views to me that i'm friendly with but i'm not friends with and i that's disagree with like yeah that dynamic that you just described now is something that i wish viewers in general would understand a little more um or even just like twitter people uh that they're at the end of the day a lot of us are co-workers so even if like when you're when you like technically associate with someone or you're friendly with someone, it doesn't actually like mean anything personal. A lot of the times, like a lot of times it's just kind of like, almost like an armistice agreement. Like, Oh, we're just not going to go after each other. Um, it doesn't mean that there's tons of disagreement. There, there aren't tons of disagreement yeah. um, or even that you privately don't like them. Um, there's a, there's a few yeah. people privately. I don't like that. I just like, do not want to cause a fucking online Twitch drama in the public sphere is not fun. Like, I don't yeah. know how you feel, but it's something that really stresses me out. It's not. And and actually, in fact, like, um, if you think the online Twitch drama is bad, like, 
the far right, the dissident right, uh, the drama with them right now yeah. is like imploding. And so that's why I'm very careful with like, uh, you know, I don't want to say anything, um, you know, because people are like flagging each other and, and DMCAing each other. And, uh, and, you know, um, I'm just kind of like staying kind of distant from that, um, maintaining friendliness with everybody, politeness with everybody. But, um, but it, it would be impossible for me to every single time somebody says something that is, um, that I disagree with, it would be, it would be impossible for me to, to reach out and publicly disagree with every single thing, because there's so many people that I, that I interact with that I disagree with. Um, and to just, uh, on the all the time at all times be on the lookout and constantly disagreeing with people in a public manner it it just really would be it would be impossible well i think people on the left are so people can be so in their bubble um about the toxicity that they see in the left and there's definitely a lot of toxicity but it's like they don't even realize the shit that's happening especially on like the alt right kind of side of the internet there is like heroes right, right and now villains is- yeah and there's yeah. there's counter like there's people like there's nuance within those groups um and they uh and yeah and there's lots of drama that goes on and yeah. a lot of toxicity and sometimes like the closer the closer you are to it the just natural like you're more likely to become a victim um of some of the yeah. shit that's going on so so one thing yeah that's the thing like um with the like dissident right like i t- i i'm already like a liberal woman like brown woman you know <laughs> who, mm-hmm. who interacts with that space so i d- i kind of am trying to be distant from that because um as soon as i indicate that i'm taking a side one way or the other i feel like it's just going to be really bad for me um so um i would i would rather just kind of maintain like they know i disagree with them they know i disagree with certain things you know they they know i disagree with a significant amount of their stuff um but as far as their in person in like infighting and all of that that's like the most toxic stuff i'd ever seen um, it's more toxic than t- than Twitch drama by far. So, so it seems um, like you have to be really careful with how who you criticize and how much you criticize in a public way because of like personal safety issues. That's the like somewhat of an impression bit, that I'm yeah, getting. A little bit, yeah, definitely. Because um, you know, people are getting swatted right now and people are DMCing e- each other right now. So um, so if I'm on a panel with people and we're talk, and the point of that panel is to talk about politics and disagree with each other, I'm very happy to do that. I'm very happy to, to disagree like vehemently with everybody. Mm-hmm. I'm very happy to yell at anybody. I've yelled at Nick Fuentes when I had him on my, when he jumped onto my show, I, I yelled at him as well, but like that's in a specific setting, uh, with the specific, like we know what we're there for. Um, uh, outside of that, like I don't comment on any of the infighting, um, Maybe if you make yourself an enemy, it's like, yeah, you, you, you end up getting targeted way more because the way this world works is that like, if you're closer to them, like they, they probably don't care about random Twitter lefties, just like, I don't know, um, like saying how much they hate Nazis. But if there's someone that like associated with someone who's associating, like it's somewhat closer and they say something, you almost feel like that person's more in danger because they're just closer. Right. Uh, yeah. So I I don't, I don't want to like make myself into like a victim or anything like that. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just like, I'm I'm trying to be kind of careful with how I interact with people on that side. Um, I just, if I take a side on, um, and on any of that stuff, I just don't, I don't want to because they, they're more horrible to each other than they are to people outside their group. Yeah. Um, do you at least understand, um, why people like would feel frustrated with, I guess, say um, how often you do talk to Nazis and all of that kind of stuff um, because like, you know, because of how dangerous, objectively dangerous their views, um, their views are. I understand it. I understand that they don't like me talking to radicals, but like one thing that people don't know is that early on when I first started streaming, before I was on Twitch, um, I initially started off arguing with like fundamentalist Muslim men. Mm-hmm. And fundamentalist Muslim men are very, very conservative. 
um, they're not that different from the alt-right, like mm-hmm. in, in all reality. Um, I have had the most mind-boggling arguments with some of those people. So if I'm supposed to disassociate with people who are on uh, on the dissident right um, and not talk to them because of their beliefs, like you're telling me that I can't talk to people even from my own background. Um, Because there are going to be some people from my own background who are very, very backwards. Um, I've had arguments about FGM. I had to argue with with one of these men about why FGM is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So so I think um, when you put that into perspective, um, the fact that I had to like actually argue with somebody that FGM was bad, um, uh, the people on the dissident right aren't really that scary to me. Um, Like the state, it almost seems like you've kind of been so hardened by it that like what other people see as um, problematic and like too, like what, where other people would put that line that that's too much, like your line is a little higher. Um, And that's because of like, you know, the standard of which, um, you know, you've engaged in your upbringing with, um, you know, with Islam and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then even like, again, early on in my streaming career, like, you know, I, I, I did argue with a significant amount of like older conservative Muslim men, and I made a lot of them angry. And I'm very lucky that none of them put like a fatwa on my head or something like that, you know, like, it, so I like, I'm not even kidding. I, I, I made a couple of them very, very, very mad with me. There um, are some crazies in that community. Like there to are. this day, the largest group that targets me is like these like, like Muslim Turkish nationalists or fascists. Like that's mm-hmm. like, that's a group that just hates me. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And no, I mean, like people were telling me before I got involved in arguing with people in that community, like you have to be careful, like some of these people like are terrorists, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, so, you know, that like after that, like I'm really not like I had a guy who would follow me around whenever I live stream and scream that I t- th- scream about me calling his prophet a, a pedophile, um, which I never did, by the way. I never did that. <laughs> but he would scream about it. Um, and so, and that was like around while I was arguing with other Muslims. So it would poison the well. Um, so it, yeah, I, after that, um, that was very stressful for me, but after that, I, I think I'm pretty unfazed by a lot of things. Do you ever worry though, like that, even if these, like the reasons why, you're engaging with them, like even the reasons why you're unfazed by it are like understandable. Do you ever worry about like at the end of the day that you're not like this private person on Discord just having these private conversations? You're like a public figure. You're a streamer that a ton of people know about and all of this stuff. So do you ever worry about like the consequences of say talking to these people in such a public way, introducing them to a lot of people, especially when they've been kind of say delegitimized or deplatformed everywhere and otherwise people wouldn't know about them? Like what if I don't one think... person changes their mind and gets converted because they watched one of your streams? So I don't think my audience is stupid enough to get converted by one stream. But at the same time, I, I do put push, provide pushback. I do provide like, you know, like, you know, remarks that are like, hey, this is contradictory. Um, and a lot of the time, these people that I'm interacting with have significantly larger audiences than I do. So if anything, I don't feel that I'm platforming them. Uh, they are platforming me. And a lot of the time, because I, of the way that my demeanor is and the way that I interact with them, um, if they're too rude to me, I end up look. I end up making them look bad. And I'll have people from their chats come over and say, like, oh, that was so wrong. They shouldn't have treated you that way. Um, so uh, there is a strategy to it. Um, you know, I, it's not perfect, but I, I think in the long run, I've had um, a lot of people, um, I've been, uh, my content has been exposed to a lot of people in those spaces. And, um, and yeah, that I think I, being able to humanize myself, but before a bunch of people that are isolated, um, a, a very large audience that feels isolated, I think is super important. 
Um, one of the reasons, so I actually used to do something similar to what you do, where I used to talk to a ton of Nazis. At the time, I hid that I was Jewish because I didn't, I couldn't even imagine being able to talk to them with them thinking I was Jewish. Um, mm -hmm. That's like obviously you don't have the op you don't have the ability to do that in your situation, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I would talk to them and I would try to convert them and humanize Jews and like all this kind of stuff, um, and uh, it just got exhausting like I, I think I changed a few minds but it was like um, overall uh, it was um, it's hearing the same arguments over and over again and putting myself and just having to associate with these types of people and then being associated with because there's always like this weird um, it's like the six degrees of separation like you you mm -hmm. associate maybe more with like the nicer of the Nazi but then like he's connected to somewhat more, a more extreme Nazi who's connected to a psycho Nazi and mm -hmm. like and so therefore that psycho Nazi now knows who you are and you're just like in that realm and I just wanted to completely leave it um they like it was it was just scary constantly being in that world um it was stressful and uh like obviously it was exhausting hiding who I was um too the I just like wonder like I how long do you think, am, is it exhausting for you? Like, do you think that you can keep this up for a long time? I think I can. I think um, I get more exhausted if I'm like fighting with mul multiple communities at the same time. So if I have like, if I'm getting hated from like, from like three communities at the same time, that can be exhausting for me. And I'm very lucky to have like mods uh, and friends who will like, who will reaffirm me and, and tell me that like, I'm in the right place. Um, and I, I, that burnout goes away. Um, uh, so I understand what you're saying. There is some burnout that can come, especially when you feel like you've put everything, you've put so much effort into these conversations and, and, um, and, and then you feel like nobody talks to you or treats you like an adult. Nobody takes you seriously. Um, and nobody thinks you're basically everybody infantilizes you. That can be that. I think that can be more frustrating for me than even like arguing with people with these crazy beliefs. A lot of the time, um, like I said, like after, after arguing with like a bunch of like fundy Muslim men and, and like growing up with that and growing up being stigmatized just because of things I couldn't control. Um, I think that, I think my tolerance is a lot higher than the average person. Um, if I were burned out, I wouldn't have like made it through my life, I think. <laughs> so, um, I, I think that, um, I think I have a very high tolerance and, and what really actually does burn me out is this kind of people misconstruing me and misconstruing my character. So, um, do you understand, like... Do you have empathy for the people whose tolerance is lower than yours? Because oh, it seems like, yeah, because mm -hmm. your tolerance is it's kind of crazy high. Like it's mm -hmm. and it's like amazing that you're able to tolerate that stuff. Um, but I would say the majority of people would not be able to tolerate that, like to to that level. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I can I, only handle a year of doing it. I definitely empathize with people who can't handle it. Um, and even, um, I think initially when I was getting like hate rated by Groypers, um, I think, um, a couple of my mods got really upset by some of the stuff that they saw. Um, and so I completely understand other people not having that tolerance, you know, you do have to decompress. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I know I'm not like a normal person. I'm a little bit like I'm a little bit crazy for doing what I'm doing, but, um, I don't expect anybody to do what I do. I think that, um, I think that there are multiple ways to be successful online. There are multiple ways to make a difference. Um, and it doesn't have to be the way that I'm doing things and who knows, maybe I'm not doing everything right. Maybe I'll, I'll make changes in the future. Um, I know I have made changes already, but, um, is there anything yeah, it's, in, it's not for everybody. Is there anything in particular that you kind of like regret doing? Like any mistakes? I think um a huge thing is 
um, at a certain point, like it, when you first talk to some people, their instinct is to, to is to dis- disrespect you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that I think that at a certain point you have to start putting boundaries down um, and say like, hey, like we're having a conversation. I know I make you content. Um, I know that you, um, uh, you know, you're, 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 you know, getting laughs out of your audience with me, but at a certain point, um, we now have to have a serious conversation and you need to treat me with respect. And I think that, um, one thing that I'm doing is I, um, I have to, I have to reach that point much sooner. Um, obviously there's a point where I build rapport with somebody like initially I build rapport with some of these people and then I demand the respect. Um, I think I just need to start doing it a little bit quicker. So what about like, there are different levels. I always say that there are different levels of Nazis, right? Um, there's nuances within the Nazi and, uh, or the alt-right or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there are some that are really unsophisticated, like the guy who did the, sh- uh, the shooting yesterday, who's just like a complete dumbass. And then there are some that are very smart, sophisticated. They know what they're doing. Um, and you have to be very prepared, in my opinion, to be able to counter them effectively. Otherwise, mm-hmm. they can come out looking like they won the debate and therefore their ideas are correct and therefore you should mm-hmm. subscribe. Yeah. So like, do you ever feel like um, before you engage in these in these top, like before you talk to one of them, that uh, you feel like, do you ever feel like unprepared, um, uh, like how uh, to to handle the more sophisticated types, like say a Nick Quintes? I think I'm actually um, uh, with people like that. So I, I interviewed Richard Spencer yesterday, and I think um, I think my strategy with people like that is to um, kind of deep dive into their emotions. So one of the things um, that I did with him is I was doing an interview with him. And I think I think one of the things is I brought up that, you know, did you lose, con- do you think you lost control of the alt right? And he said, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I said, how does it feel to now have your biggest enemies be part of the alt right? Um, to see somebody like Nick Fuentes, who is successful, who's achieved levels of success that you never were able to, um, how does it feel to be abandoned by this group that you put years of your work into? Um, and I think like questions like that are kind of what can put me kind of ahead, um, uh, so I, I think, I think it's questions like that, that kind of put me ahead. I, I'm not always debating these people. Sometimes I'm just having a conversation with them. Um, but do you see why some people would say that, that that's problematic, particularly like if you're going to, I know you say that you're not platforming them, but, um, talking to them is still somewhat legitimizing. Um, and even if their audience is larger than you. So if you're going to talk to them, um, why, like, if you're not talking to them in a very critical kind of form where you're criticizing their ideas, you could potentially be normalizing them and then normalizing their ideas. And then maybe it'll start, their ideas will start entering the sphere, right? And more people will start converting to them as we see with any ideas. I can definitely see that. I think that the way that I conduct myself in some of these interviews is it's, um, we with that interview specifically was meant to understand why he believes what he, you know, first off, understand what does he believe? Secondly, why does he believe what he believes? And thirdly, like, where is he now in his career? Um, I, I do plan on, on doing more um, pushback with him, but like yesterday, I think was just more kind of exploring, like, like I, it was very frank, like you failed. Like, how did that make you feel? to fail to somebody so much younger than you, to fail to somebody who has um, wrongly accused you of things. How did it feel to have that recording leaked where you were saying that Fuente should be mowing your lawn? Um, like these, like, I think that these are things that put people in perspective. Um, 
he maybe like seems like a, a a scary guy to a lot of people but like the reality of the situation is is like he he lost control of that movement um and that movement now makes up that movement is is now some of his biggest enemies so um yeah but they're not his biggest enemies because he like has changed his mind with his ideology he still no believes in it doesn't matter though objectively it, it, untrue yeah. things and stuff right he does he does he still believes he's still a racial supremacist all of that but um i i think i think it, it's not at that point um it's more i think that uh drawing attention to the fact that one he's not in control of that movement and and two like even when he was in control he didn't take it nearly as far as one just did um, I think that that kind of also puts him in perspective. I know that it's not because people on that side are not his biggest enemies because of his, well, actually they are some of his beliefs. Like he's, he believes in the vaccine that, um, they they virtue signal with each other about whether they've gotten the vaccine or not. And the very fact that Spencer's gotten vaccinated actually, um, is a huge, huge thing for them. They they think like that he's cringe because of it. But uh, it, yeah, I, I think that it, you know, illuminating where there's you know there's infighting as well, illuminating where these people are not as cohesive as you think they are. You know, so um, uh, yeah, just learning about why they believe the things that they believe, how they've changed over time as well. So, um, well. I think one of the problems sometimes is like when you're having a lot of these conversations, you're going to have just naturally, you're going to have some overlap, right? With like audiences, mm -hmm. just in general, yeah. um, just me having this conversation with you, I'm going to have some overlap with your audience. Maybe I'll get some members of your audience to start hopping in my streams and you'll get some of my audience, et cetera. Um, and I, I like, you know, hopefully that's a good thing. But um, with, you know, in this nefarious pe personalities uh, like a Nick Fuentes or um, or any of these like alt-right type people, uh, the some, some of the types of people that you're going to get who are going to like join your community are going to naturally push other people out, right? I don't think so. I think if we keep a really tight ship in the community, I think that... Um, I think that people will will fall in the line. Uh, so one thing is I did get a decent amount of people who would jump over from like my streams where I would like talk to people like that. Um, and if they misbehaved a certain way, um, they're gone. Um, they they know immediately like what the rules are in my community. Um, and I'm not willing to sacrifice my existing members for um, for members who don't respect the the environment. Um, so I think you do have to run a tight ship with that. And I think my mods are really good at that. I feel like even if you have the best mods in the world, there's only so much you can control like with um, just like being, I don't know, like just associations. Like, and this is why when, it, if we can tie this back to the, the initial drama with the Kethel's situation, um, mm -hmm. that there's like, a, um, while, I would like I wouldn't subscribe that to you personally. There's tons of people that I don't associate with, not because I dislike them, not because I think anything badly about them, but I just know who they associate with and I just don't want to go near it. It's almost like um yeah, yeah it's cuz I just know how social stuff works and it's almost like a, a it's almost like an STI, you know, like where like uh you like you don't you feel bad for the other person, but you don't want to you don't want to get the STI. You know, you don't want to if you go near um it's like nuclear. And so it like, because I'm sure yeah. that there's some overlap and there's some Groiper type people in your audience and, um, and all that kind of stuff. It just like, would make sense. Like why someone just doesn't want to. Yeah. I have no problem with know. people not wanting to associate with me. I just didn't, I, I, I don't know why she had to like draw attention to me. Um, uh, and, and why all of her mods were like watching my my stream. Um, I understand not wanting to associate with me. I do think you like, I think you're underestimating a little bit how much you can control your chat. If you put on slow mode, if you, um, if you have like a bunch of precautions in chat, like people learn very quickly what's accepted and what's not accepted. And we just ban very quickly when we've got new people who are 
who are of a certain type in there. Um, uh, and if they don't respect the rules, I do have people who come over from other audiences that are, um, that are unsavory audiences who have learned very quickly what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And, um, for the most part, they have behaved. Um, but, um, yeah, if there are people who are unruly, if there are people who are nefarious, they get outed pretty quickly. Um, and, um, and again, I don't expect anybody to feel obligated to associate with me. Um, I think that people, um, should make the choices that they want to. I have no problem with that. Um, but, um, I just don't understand why she was, why she had to one, like watch it and then be seething at me while she's watching it. Um, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay. So I actually think that that is totally different than a lot of people's perspectives um, of what happened and what they thought you were upset about. So that's like- I'm not upset. Of, yeah. yeah. No, that, I didn't, like, I'm not upset at all. Uh, you you for, felt like she had every right to not come yeah, on the panel. 100%. And you, and you understand. You, and you totally understand like why someone doesn't want to be, um, why someone's anxious about uh, to be around, you know, yeah. people who've been around growers and all that stuff. And it totally makes sense for her, especially. Um, 100%. Yeah. I understand so it was 100%. just, it was the other behavior associated. It was with the other night. behavior. It was her one. She was, I, I, so I was in the middle of this panel and somebody messaged me that Keffels is watching the panel and she's really mad with you. Um, and so already that's kind of like intimidating and, uh, and, and overwhelming, right? I don't need anybody to like associate with me or choose to be on a panel because I'm there. I don't need any of that. Um, mm -hmm. what, uh, what, was, what was kind of distressing for me is that now she's watching the panel. I'm hearing that she's talking about me um, and that she's mocking me. And, with a and very, that her very large audience. She's yeah, and her chat is now mocking me. I also see that her... Um, uh, she's made a subtweet about me, mm -hmm. um, which is already drawing attention to me. So I quote tweeted that. Um, and then she replied to me saying, like, it's funny, you know who you are, even though I didn't mention you. Um, but I mean, like, what, what am I what am I supposed to do? Um, you know, it's just uh, I I have no problem if she doesn't want to associate with me, if she doesn't want to talk to me. One hundred percent. That is, you know, keep yourself safe. Um, but why are you directing all of this negative attention to me? when you should know that I already have a lot of negative attention that's directed towards me. Yeah, I think, and this is one of my criticisms for Keffels, um, and in general, right, uh, is that I feel like she sometimes um, doesn't think about the consequences of, um, of how she talks about people, of the claims she makes about people, like, you saw, like, you and I are almost a little more seasoned. Like, we're, uh, when we, like, you're very careful with your words. You said that multiple times. Um, and I try to be really careful with my words. And I think that that's something that I wish she would be, like, that would be, I guess, like, my criticism. She needs to think about the consequences of that stuff. And I think, like, what I'm guessing is she didn't think, like, at the end of the day, it's like, we all, it's like it's just it's just a mean mean girl thing to do you know like to just make fun of someone especially when your audience is so large and like to laugh at them I get it um and even if I think like I understand the criticisms um I understand why she doesn't want to be on it. I I think it yeah I definitely think it came off me and, and when I saw um and I can only imagine how that felt from your perspective when you're like on there and you're like you have a camera on you and everything and you know that there's like thousands of people like laughing at you that fucking like who I don't know you'd have to be a fucking robot to not feel like a kid getting bullied in that situation right um yeah I mean it's yeah. not anything I'm not used to again you know it's not anything I'm not used to on a very frequent basis but um the way that somebody like Zonia put it really well for me that I feel like an island um uh mm -hmm. Like, I know that I don't have anybody to fall back on um, uh, if I have uh, other than like my community. I don't have anybody to fall back on um, when it comes to the amount of negative attention I get from all sides. Um, you know, I get it from like both like political sides and then and then non-political sides, too. Um, 
And so, um, so I, I don't, I, I'm used to that kind of stuff. I'm used to like being an island, but it's still, um, it's still, like I said, it's heartbreaking when I put this much work, this much passion into what I do and I'm being misconstrued, um, and being what it feels like targeted, um, and, uh, and, you know, I've had people in the recent weeks, like advocate for people to, um, mass flag my YouTube channel. Um, so I, it, it's heartbreaking for me because I'm so passionate for about this, but, um, it doesn't matter, I guess, what, whatever work I put into, it doesn't matter to people like how much effort I put into this. Um, and, and you know, that's part of it too, is that they think that I've done nothing to prepare for this. They don't know like my history. They don't know what I've what I've done in the past. They don't know the type of people that I've argued with in the past and the type of people I've had following me around and harassing me in the past. Um, so yeah, it's very heartbreaking. It's very frustrating. Um, and uh that's just what it was for me. So what a what kind of has there been any criticism of you that you that made you kind of like look inward or like uh take some pause and thinking that there might be some legitimacy to it i mean i'm sure like people seem to think that i'm i'm just somebody who rolls over and i think a lot of the time that's because of my mannerisms um but i don't think i do i think i think i do push back on things and i think people who think that about me haven't watched the entirety of my content and don't watch the way that i push back on things or the way that i make people uncomfortable on purpose um so that is something um also just like the timing of things um sometimes sometimes i will do things that will inev that will like unintentionally make somebody really mad at me um so i mean there's always like work to be done there but as far as like pushing back on people, I do think that I'm I'm definitely I'm pretty good at pushing back on people. Um, I'm pretty good at like having conversations with people and and kind of diving to the into the nuances of of the things that they believe in and their past and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's always room for improvement. Yeah, I just wonder like, because I again I used to talk to Nazis myself. Um, and uh, I once, um, I don't know, I remember once hosting a conversation where I felt um, like, I felt like the Nazi ended up coming out looking better. Um, I've had one of those. Yeah, I've had one of those. And so like, do you, um, did you feel shitty afterwards? Like, um, did you feel like, cause that, that's definitely how I felt like that. Yeah. Had, one time was enough for me. Time. One time, uh, uh, getting like fucking blown out of the water was enough for me to, you know, never want that to happen again. So I think, um, uh, and one of, one of my chatters here said something, you know, there's this weird undertone on the pushback side of no, not like that, but other creators get away with the exact same thing, which I think is also something that like, People always don't like the way that I, I do things, um, the way that I push back. And even though there are other creators who do the exact same thing and nobody criticizes them because for it. Because you're not as aggro, like you're not, do you think like you're maybe you're more feminine in how you push back? I mean, even there, even other creators who, who are, you know, pretty casual in the way they talk to people, um, are, don't don't um, get criticized the same way. I think people just like to infantilize me or tell me what they think they is the best way, and that the way that I did it wasn't the best way. But I mean, yeah, there has been like my debate with Sean Last is one where like I will never forget that debate. That debate was one of the most painful debates I've ever had. Um, what happened? Uh, I spent like two weeks what uh, like reading this dude's blog posts. This dude is like a race realist, hardcore race realist. And I went through like all of his blog posts and debunked all of them like on stream with my friends. And then like the debate comes and everything goes out the window for me. Mm -hmm. So that's happening before. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, just everything went out the window. Uh, it was so painful. It was such a pain. I mean, people said that I rebounded in the second half, but you know, like the second half is too late. Um, so uh, so definitely that one, that one's a painful one. 
It's a painful memory I'll never forget about. Um, but, uh, but I do think that I am very confident in the way that I push back on people. I don't think that I'm particularly softer than anybody else. I think I do have to maintain a little bit more politeness just because of being a woman in a media sphere, Mm -hmm. but I don't think being polite necessarily means that I'm not pushing back. Um, I think I do push back very hard on people when I have the ability to. Um, and I think that people just want to tell me that I'm not doing it right. Um, would you ever, would you ever sit down and have a conversation with Kefels? Yeah, I offered that much to her, um, that night that she was watching me. Um, I said, you know, please come talk to me. I would love to have a talk with you. Um, because I think if she understood where I was coming from and like my history and my past, that maybe she would understand why I do the things that I do. This is like, it just reminds this is why I like doing these interviews, um, because I still disagree with you associating with Flamenco and Mr. Girl and, um, and, uh, and some of the interviews that you do. Um, so that hasn't, for me, that hasn't changed that, but I, but at the, like, I don't, I, it's something that I, I really get frustrated with the left in general, or just like with this online sphere that like, you can't disagree with someone or um without like coming to this awful conclusion about their character and Mm -hmm. um and it's like sometimes people like I just I just think you're incorrect about it I don't think like and I'm sure you think I'm incorrect about it and uh I don't think that that we'd probably just have different information and different experiences that have led us to come to a different conclusion um it doesn't Mm -hmm. mean necessarily there's like this you know you're a bad person um and Uh, or I'm a bad person or anything like that. It's totally possible. Like you've had very, like I had experiences that led me to come to that conclusion. And uh, humans are emotional creatures as much as we like to think we're like above, above Mm -hmm. it. Um, And you've obviously like had experiences that, you know, that focus for you, like the way that you deal with this stuff is like, you see ostracization as this incredibly harmful thing. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I, and I understand that I feel bad ostracizing people too. Um, I guess for me, like the way I've kind of justified it in my head, um, uh, is that it's like a small immoral deed for a larger moral good, you know? Um, I guess, but yeah. as somebody who felt ostracized from like both, like, American culture and from my own like um, it's personal for you cultural heritage yeah I I know what it feels like to be ostracized from all all sides um it's not something that's new to me so um so is that how you felt that night like on, on hippy dippy you felt like ostracized um no I I so no I I think I've kind of gotten used to to being ostracized I think what I felt that night I just quite honestly with you when I say I was heartbroken um I think that's just all I could I could say about that night is that I was heartbroken that um I was being portrayed in a way that was so uncharitable that didn't seem to understand where I was coming from that didn't seem there was there's no charitability in the amount of work that I put into what I do, the amount of research in, into what I do, the amount of preparation I do for like when I talk to people. Like I don't think people see, you know, behind the scenes like how much work I put into this, um, and and structuring conversations and and how I'm going to carry out these conversations, and then what I'm doing behind the scenes while I'm having these conversations. There's a lot of stuff that people don't see. Um, and it's not, I'm not just walking into conversations unprepared with no research. Um, I research very heavily. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I read up on like different things, um, a lot and, uh, it, it's just heartbreaking that, um, I put so much effort into this and so much of my passion into this and to be taken so uncharitably yeah especially that you seem to really focus on hard work um like you said you said yourself that you've got like this really intense work ethic and it probably really i mean it's probably i I would say hard work is not exactly a value 
a very strong value that I see a lot perpetuated in the online sphere of the left. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so honestly, that makes sense. Um, honestly, like getting to that with what you were saying, let's let's talk about Mr. Girl, um, because uh, there's got to be, um, I guess, like for me, that was probably the the area that I've, I've had my strongest disagreement with you. Um, mm -hmm. because I didn't see, I didn't really like, I didn't really hate it that much when people talk to Mr. Girl, like I didn't, but it was, um, but I kept seeing like tweets and stuff of you saying how much you liked him, how he was such a good guy, like, and it was like the personal affirmations of, uh, of him when everything I had seen was like, so, ugh. <laughs> and, um, and so I kind of want to, I want to get into that. Like, um, uh, yeah. why, like, why do you, why do you like the guy? <laughs> so when I talk to him, um, and don't get me wrong, um, Mr. Girl and I do actually disagree on a lot of things. Um, uh, there, there are significant, like, amounts of what he believes that I just heavily disagree with. but. Um, when I talked to him, um, I kind of, I got the feeling that a lot of this comes from a personal place from him. Um, and so when I, when I interviewed him, um, like stuff that really stuck out to me was, you know, his upbringing, um, the, you know, the life that he's lived, um, uh, and in some way, I think that the way he talks about these things, um, is a way for himself to understand the way that people have hurt him. Um, he, um, like, like one thing that, um, stuck out to me is like his mother was like sexually attracted to him growing up. Um, and he, uh, she broke the boundary with him by like telling him that, um, later on, um, she had kicked him out of the house, uh, and he didn't have any contact with her. And then later on, he w confronted her about, like, why did you kick me out of the house? And she wrote him this letter saying that she was sexually attracted to him. And um, and I think I think he said that basically he did feel like something was up, something was wrong when he did live with her. Something was creepy. Um, I think the way that he talks about a lot of this stuff is him trying to come to terms with that. And he says it's not. But um, but like, uh, you know. He uh he does this thing where he thinks that other people are lying. I think he's lying about that. <laughs> so um I I think that he is um I think the reason why he is so intensely focused on certain issues is because they have this very personal um connection to him. But do you think um, that I feel yeah. I've read um I mean, I've read so much history about all these awful people throughout history, and they always, they're not, like, awful out of, like, a vacuum. Like, they're always, there's shit that happened to them. Um, like, even, like, the dumbest, awful, worst, like, emperors of Rome. Like, there are reasons mm -hmm. why why they are, right? So, like, bad people always have reasons for, you know, the reasons why they're bad. Um, but... Uh, you know, unless like the devil is speaking through them or something, um, which is very rare. But uh, so like to me, uh, whether or not I, it feels like that, that logic, even though I understand it because it's compassionate and I get it. Um, you could use that logic to, um, to basically say that you like everyone, that every, that you like everyone and everyone is a good person and everyone's a good guy. Um, you know, therefore it's somewhat vacuous, you know? I think, yeah. So I think the difference is like, um, um, he hasn't, so he has, a, he, he is very honest about like the, the wrongs that he's done, um, in his life. Uh, he's very honest about like the ugliest parts of him. And I think that, um, I think that honesty is very valuable. Um, and if he ever did something that was irredeemable, I think he would be very forward about it. Um, 
he's willing to have very, very uncomfortable conversations. And while I don't agree with everything that he says, I don't agree with everything that he does. Um, I can appreciate um, as somebody myself who tries to have very honest conversations with people. Um, I can appreciate somebody else who also tries to have honest conversations, I suppose. Well, if we're talking about someone who's openly admitting he's openly admitted to domestic abuse, he's openly mm -hmm. admitting he's openly admitted to um, being a rapist. He's openly admitted to mm -hmm. sexually having uh, attraction to children like these are not like things that like the crazy left has said, like these are things that he himself has said. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's why he gets the impression, like he gives the impression people are like, whoa, like you're openly admitting these things. Like, I think that that appeals to a lot of people and I understand why. Um, but it also, it also struck me and I realized I'm being critical of myself because of something, what I said earlier in the stream, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's being honest, right? Um, because he's admitting things that normally people wouldn't admit to, because for all we know, there might be even worse things. Um, that he's not admitting to like he's only admitting to like the 10 percent that he's willing to um like we like we never know so like how do you know that he's just being honest um i think even admitting to being a domestic abuser is is uh something that would get a lot of people a lot of people would not want to admit to that um he admitted to it um i asked him about it um i think in my interview he talked about uh, the, you know, and I believe him because he talked about how hard it was to get a therapist that would, that would see him, um, for his he issue. Creep, he creeped out his therapist regularly, right? Uh, yeah, he creeped out his therapist, but also therapists would turn you away if you had any history of, um, domestic abuse. And so, um, and it was hard for him to get a therapist who would see him, um, despite his history. Uh, so I think that kind of, to me, shows somebody who is trying to be a better person. Um, as far as like, uh, the rape thing, um, I, I, I don't think that it was, I don't think it's right in any way. I, I, I see the conversation, conversation he's trying to have. Um, but, um, the, it's more of a conversation about like, we we need to start thinking about these things um in much more nuance uh just because you see when he says that it really yeah. it really comes off to me like he is trying to excuse it or um intellect intellectualize yeah. and intellectualize I don't think, his abuse yeah i don't i don't think he, i i i don't think his intention was to excuse it really but I definitely can see where where other people and even I, to some extent, think that like the video maybe wasn't the best at communicating whatever message he was trying to communicate with it. Um, uh, most people are not capable of reading body language like that. You know, most people are not. Um, the safest way to engage with a sexual encounter is to get that verbal consent. Um, uh, I think, I think everybody should do that. And, and probably telling people on the internet that you didn't do that is probably not a good idea because the prevalence of people on the internet yeah, are I not agree. good but at in body his, language. Yeah. In his situation, the woman literally was telling him to stop. Right? She told she him that she wasn't ready. Um, yeah. yeah, she told him that she wasn't ready and then he pulled her down on, onto him and then they had intercourse and. I think they had plans to meet right. up again or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, tech yeah. I mean, that's what it was. That's why, like, even in like the most conservative yeah. circles, that would be considered right. Yeah. Yeah. It would be. So, like, remember earlier when I asked you, we talked about like um, earlier, like when I asked you about uh, what would someone have to do for you to not want to associate with them? Like, you said, like, if they'd actually, if, uh, say, Flamenco had actually committed a hate crime, right? Um, and you said that you probably wouldn't, if I remember correctly, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, like, why why is Mr. Girl different, right? Is it because he uh, admits to it and he said, like, he admits to it? I think partly he admits to it, and I think he knows that it wasn't right. Um, uh, in one of the conversations I had with him and a few other people, um, he specifically said, you know, I'm, I'm not saying what I did was right. Um, uh, 
and and even when he talked about the domestic abuse, he also said it wasn't right. Um, it was. Uh, I think I think he he knows when things he does aren't right, and I think that. Um, I, I mean, honestly, with the with the rape story as well, like, um, it's it is there is a lot of gray in 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 these things in these conversations and he knows that he wasn't right for for that but at the same time that that woman like technically yes it is rape but that also that woman wanted to meet up with him again um so i i don't know you know i like i i it's such a it's it's so it's so obviously he shouldn't have done it um but there there needs to be a conversation around these things and um and I think I think it's valuable to have a conversation around these things. I don't think it's responsible maybe to say that like that um, you knew her body language because most people don't. Most people are not good at body language readers. So, yeah. Yeah, but I just like I still it's something I don't talk about like rape or sexual assault a lot because I just feel so unqualified to talk about it. Um, yeah. And um, and uh, yeah, and I'm not. I'm not a victim of, um, I'm not a, a victim or a survivor. So it's like, I don't, of, uh, of assault. So like, I also, I just feel, yeah. So I try not to talk about it as much as possible. Yeah. Um, but I also like wonder, like when he's, it's so to me and from the research that I've seen as just as a layman, um, that by, by like the way he talks about it and the way he, he gives, even though he'll say something's wrong, but then he's excusing it. Then he's justifying it. It's like where he'll say it's wrong. It's wrong to assault children. But let's be real. Most men really want to like where he's trying to like normalize it. And it feels very much. Um, it feels a little sneaky. You know, it feels a little weasley. I could see that. I think what he's trying to do there is not trying to normalize it like the that it's that it's OK to do that. I think he's trying to say that a lot of people feel this way and it's a problem. Um, and we need to acknowledge that a lot of people feel this way. Uh, so I think that the disconnect here is that a lot of people are looking at his stuff and saying that his messages, a lot of pe people feel this way, it's normal, but his messages, a lot of people feel this way um, and it's not okay and we need to do something or we need to be aware of it. And I think, I think there is some truth in that because, um, you know, majority of people who get assaulted or get molested are molested by people that they know, um, usually a family member. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, there, there is like, I think understanding like how prevalent that is and how, um, how, how likely it is, is really important. So you can, you can prevent it. Um, he always advocates for people to go get help for those kinds of things. Um, I think his, his main, message around that has been that like this performative um this perf performative anger towards um like you know pedophiles the like not even the non-offending ones like is um well specifically non-offending ones the the performative um anger is not helpful in preventing child assault but he if doesn't anything, know that uh no no there there is studies there are studies, no, there's studies that, that say the opposite that's why i'm saying like it's a thing that he, he so he interviewed he interviewed a, a person who is like uh, like some uh, professor who does research on preventing um, child sexual assault and performative anger towards towards pedophiles um, has been like uh, is is seen to like not be helpful in that because then pedophiles don't get help for their problem. Okay. Um. And yeah, that's where the issue is. So, um, from all the experts that like I've researched and all of that kind of stuff um, mm -hmm. is that there, I know that that can't be true because there, it maybe it what it would be true if there was a treatment, right? But there is currently no, like um, no accepted treatment for, yeah. uh, for pedophilia. So the idea that like we're reducing the chances of someone going and getting help, it's like that implies that there's treatment. Like the reason why we try to destigmatize a lot of like other things um, is because we know that there is an accepted treatment to, um, to fix yeah. things, right? But I do think it's totally fine for like a society to be like, okay, we don't know how to treat it. Um, so like 
maybe we should make a, a, to a social taboo because social taboos have been effective in like tons of societies. So maybe we should make a social taboo mm -hmm. about a certain su subject. And yeah. until like we can actually, and that doesn't mean that people can't actual researchers should sure. research so, and all that. Mm -hmm. So, so a huge disconnect here as well is that majority of child sex offenders are not pedophiles. Um, there is a significant more likelihood of a pedophile to become a child sex offender, mm -hmm. but majority of child sex offenders are not pedophiles. Um, uh, and so, yeah, when I say um, pedophile, I'm talking about the um, colloquial definition, not obviously not the exclusively attractive. Well, I think I can, this, and then that's where the disconnect is because he's specifically mm -hmm. talking about people who are non offending. Um, so, um, yeah, but the obvious, the obviously, actual... when we okay, sorry, well. Yeah, obviously, when somebody is offending, like that is horrible, and they should, um, you know, like all of the all of the stigma and all it, it, they deserve to be punished for it. Um, but I think he specifically is talking about non offending. He's made that very clear in a lot of his videos that he talks about non offending pedophiles. He talks about the technical definition of pedophiles, and that they it's better for them to go at least seek therapy. Like even if there's no accepted treatment for it, for them to seek therapy, so so people can keep them away from children. He thinks that they shouldn't be anywhere near children. Um, uh, to to make sure that they don't seek out jobs where they're near children. Um, and I think that um, I I don't think he would disagree that like um people who offend should be punished for it. But um, but I I do think that he is specifically talking about non-offending pedophiles and and he also often brings up the fact that a lot of child sex offenders are not pedophiles a lot of uh, sex offenders in general are people who are doing it they're for sexual other sexual opportunists um yeah but uh yeah i mean the term pedophile doesn't mean that they haven't engaged actually acted on it it just means uh the actual term doesn't even mean that you're attracted to children it means that you're exclusively attracted to children so mm -hmm. it's a it's so it's a term that even he doesn't he doesn't actually even use the correct definition himself um he's just using his own definition uh so that's why like um yeah so that's why i, I don't really understand that um but again this is like it's so hard because again I really well, really... non-offending pedophiles are apparently in the majority, like statistically, um, of pedophiles, right? Um, and so I well, think I mean, that's what he's trying to, what he's trying to sense. talk about. It's probably yeah. there's probably little opportunity that um, to target a child, right? As well, and uh, and um, also and they sure don't want to. And some, yeah, and I'm sure wrong. there's sometimes. I'm sure there's some like plant tons of them that have a. Yeah, recognize that it's immoral and like a lot of people have really shitty desires and don't act on them right so, yeah uh, um also somebody said it's not exclusive um the actual um it, uh, definition is persistent and recurring sexual interest um no, but it's not pri it's primary primary mostly exclusive that's like yeah that's in the dsm um but uh um, um but yeah so i but again this is again like I I've seen psychologists like literally watch videos of him and say and just say like this is so dangerous like this is so problematic like and I think there's a reason why he got banned off of platforms like Twitch and stuff um, mm -hmm. where I, I don't even know if I would have a problem with them having these conversations in private but because like they're in such a public sphere and they're for inter people's entertainment and because we don't know if these conversations could potentially cause harm like what if someone was effectively closing that shit up you know, and um, not acting on it. And then they started to feel like, oh, like maybe it is somewhat normal. He did say that like, you know, most men kind of really feel like this. And um, and he did say that he feels like this and he doesn't seem like a bad guy. I mean, Stardust like some blah, 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 you know? And um, uh, what if like, maybe it's not that bad and maybe he'll start thinking about it more and not suppressing it as much and maybe he'll act on it. Um, you know, like it's, I don't know. We just, we don't know like, we don't know the amount of harm it can cause. And so to me, it's just something that like, it's like talking about nuclear energy. Like I feel like you shouldn't talk about it unless like you're very educated about it. And as much as, uh, and even now, like we're debating these intricate details of like definitions and all this stuff. Like so much of the stuff is still up for debate and in the air. And yeah, I just feel like we're so unqualified to like, 
it just really scares me that we might potentially make things worse. You know. So I'm actually looking at the DSM five specifiers here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, it's saying non-exclusive type sexual attraction to adults and children can be also one of the specifiers. Um, so it's not necessarily exclusive. Um, there are people, I'm sure, who they are use the word primary. They use the word primary. Uh, yeah, but primary doesn't necessarily mean exclusive, does it? No, it's a, but it does mean mostly, mostly exclusive or it's like it's their form. It's the primary. It's like the main form of a sexual attraction. So they might still feel sexually attracted here or there to other people. But um, like the main focus, like the main thing they're into is that. Um, here, so I just that's, posted that's the too. colloquial. I mean, either way, they use the word to primary. He doesn't use that definition. So he definitely. Uh, so he uses his own definition for pedophile for what he finds useful. Yeah. So I just linked you something. Um, I guess you can take a look if you want. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, I mean, again, like, uh, you know, I'm friends with a guy. Um, that doesn't mean that I agree with everything that he says. Um, I do. I do see where he's coming from and why he is um, so passionate about certain subjects. Um, but um, you know, if there, you know, people are saying that like, oh, what he does is like harmful. Um, you know, like that's bad, obviously. But I mean, he's also interacting and interviewing like um, professors and psychiatrists and leaders of different organizations who work on this kind of stuff too. So. I can't really say, um, uh, you know. So what you're saying is that you try to look at him as a whole, you know? So you uh, recognize that yeah. there's some, like, incorrect things, like, that he does and all that kind of stuff. I, I mean, there's, again, a significant amount of the stuff that, like, we we both disagree on. Um, but uh, but I do think that he is honestly trying to do good in the world. Um, uh, whether that he's doing that the right way, I can't really say. But I think he is trying to say that, like, people need to acknowledge that this is a reality, because if we don't acknowledge that it's a reality, and this is very true, if you make pedophiles and sex offenders out to be these monsters who could no way be part of uh, it near you or anything near you, you know, that's how, like, people turn a blind eye to family members um, abusing children, right? Like, they think, like, there's no way, you know, like... Um, but, um, the reality is, is a lot of children grow up not even knowing that they're being sexually abused. Yeah. I, I think if he did that, I wouldn't have as much of a problem with them. Right. But, um, yeah, again, it feels like that's what he wants people to think he's doing. And when I hear and I see his content and I see the arguments, it definitely doesn't come off that way. Um, it comes off like he's being a little... Like, like he, he tries to excuse it. I remember listening to the Vosh conversation particularly that I found. I wish the whole thing, no editing, nothing. And um, it really just seemed like he was, it kind of, I don't know, like it, it really seemed like he was trying to normalize I think, um, it. I didn't really listen to the Vosh conversation, um, but I've listened to his other content. And from what I can tell from his other content, um, um, he very much has said and even in interviews with me he said that i think like people who realize that they're attracted to children should stay the fuck away from children um you know like they they should be not not be working anywhere around children they you know they're not capable of doing it um uh and the uh let's see um there is an issue with people who have non-disordered behavior not getting early therapy with uh pedophilia it looks like um but uh, yeah, so I think that's kind of what he's trying to address. Um, it, there is a very much, there are real issue in, in the, the statistic that, you know, most child sex offenders are not pedophiles is a real statistic uh, and something that we need to acknowledge um, and something that, you know, um, yes, pedophiles are going to be more likely to be child sex offenders. And that's why they need to go and seek therapy um, and not feel like they're going to get executed or put in jail for even having a thought.
I guess, like, yeah, I I really feel like that's not what he comes down to. But we might have to dis- agree to disagree on this in this situation. Um, yeah. The uh, yeah, because otherwise, like, this whole conversation would just turn into us debating Mr. Girl stuff. Um, but like, I guess, like, do you? I guess understand at least like why um, uh, why it would be frustrating, like why. Um, n- that you didn't just talk to him or you weren't like, but you were like kind of actively like endorsing him as like a, you know, he's like a great person. Um, like why, yeah, I understand yeah, why that. that would be hurtful. I, I especially. Understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. And I think, um, uh, I think like, you know, I, you don't have to agree with me and, and, you know, again, I don't even agree with everything that Mr. Girl says. Um, but, uh, I think I what see are where some he, disagreements? What he's trying. Like, um, uh, I'd have to like really go into it. Um, like I have disagreements on like, I think he's like, um, he's a gender abolitionist and I don't necessarily agree with him on that. Um, that's just like, I don't even, I don't, I'm not a gender abolitionist. Um, uh, there are some other things I, I would really have to like go into it, but there are significant things that we disagree on. I think we just have very um similar communication he doesn't styles believe trans people like really exist right like he doesn't believe it yeah i don't agree with that either so um yeah like uh yeah there's like significant large portions of stuff that he believes that i don't believe and stuff that i believe that he doesn't believe so yeah um but we have very similar communication styles and i see where he's tr- where he's trying to go with his most controversial conversations so yeah so i'm guessing you don't think he he should have been banned twitch i don't know why he was banned on twitch so um uh and you know that's why i wrote that whole letter about like please unban him and stuff but um you know that's up to twitch um i guess so yeah no that makes sense um yeah okay what's another character that someone has like i don't know is there someone else like did i miss someone because i know flamenco mr girl I mean, Nick Fuentes popped into one of my panels um, on a Sunday one time and people were saying, like, I shouldn't have had him on. But like, if you like, what am I going to do? Like, do I want to be seen forever as like the brown girl who's afraid of Nick Fuentes? Like, no, I'm I'm going to have him on. I yelled at him just like I yelled at everybody else because that's how I moderate. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, like, I'm I'm not going to let people tell me and dictate to me how I should talk to other people. So how does someone, okay, um, one of the th- hardest things about being a content creator, I think so many people, uh, ContraPoints really touched on this really well, is that so many people would be like, well, just take some criticism. We're just giving you criticism. But they don't realize that as a public figure, you get criticism 24-7. It's like, and so much of it is not charitable. So much of it is not productive. So how do you like, but at the same time, I I can't speak for you, but like, I don't want to become the type of person that never takes criticism. So like, how do you find that happy medium between taking, like, how do you find what is legitimate criticism and what is something that you can just completely dismiss as someone just trying to control you? Yeah. I think, I think you can tell like when somebody's being constructive with criticism and when somebody is just constantly, um, uh, nagging you about, um, you should be, shouldn't be talking to this person. You shouldn't be talking to that person. If it's about the way that I talk to people, then I think I can generally tell like, um, okay, maybe there's something here that I need to improve upon. But if it's, if it's just a blanket, like you shouldn't talk to these people, talking to these people is, you know, all that, like, um, yeah, I think, I think it's stuff like that. I think, I think in general, most content creators can tell when somebody is coming from a constructive place and when somebody is just coming from a hateful place. So I feel like I can't tell. Like I struggle with that every day. Um, uh-huh. so I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how you can tell. Um, Vosh told me also when I asked him the same question, he said that, uh, uh, he like, um, he said to just not, never take criticism from, the public and only from people that you know. Um, I think that's true to an extent. And and one thing that I am very grateful for is I have excellent community members who will mm-hmm. sift through a lot of that stuff and who will find the the valid criticisms and tell me about it. And um and 
and then, you know, the non-valid ones, they'll kind of just leave, you know, so. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, do you, like, if you look back at your, like, streaming, because how long have you been streaming now? Like, a, more than more than a year, right? Yeah, like a year and a half, I think. A year and a half. So. Um, so, do you look back, and you are probably one of the few, I think you're the only, like, South Asian in the space, right? An, outside, Gappy a is female. A... Yeah, female. Yeah. Gappy's mm -hmm. also, right? Um, so, do you feel like any of the shit that you've had to deal with, because you've definitely had to deal with a lot of shit, do you think any of that is either racism or maybe, like, some implicit, like, racism? Um, does it ever I feel like that? I think that it's more sexism. Um, uh, I think I, I encounter, um, I mean, obviously, I encounter more racism when I interact with far-right people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I interact with far-right people and I get race, a ton of racism and a ton of sexism. Um, but when it's on the left and it's like kind of covert, it's, it's hard to tell. I do think that I'm infantilized a lot. I think a lot of people don't realize the history that I have, the amount of work that I've done in the past. Um, Again, if you had to argue with like um like an like an old Muslim man about why like female genital mutilation is wrong, like I think you would realize that pretty quickly that like nothing like nothing conveys you after that. Um mm -hmm. so yeah, um so like people really people don't give me enough credit, I feel. Um they don't know they they underestimate how much work I put into this kind of stuff how much reading I do for this kind of stuff, how much I work on the connections that I have with other people. Um, and that can be very frustrating. It's so interesting that you feel like you've dealt with more uh, sexism than racism. Um, Cause I- On the left, at least. On the right, um, on the right, I get a lot of racism and a lot of sexism and I can't really even tell which one's worse, so. That's why it's funny. I was having a conversation with someone recently um, talking about I guess some of the sexual harassment in my dms and I always I said like I think I once tweeted like it's just I, I never it never phases me like the sexism that I get in my dms like it never bothers me um it never ruins my day uh it just feels like nothing because the other stuff that I'm getting is like vile descriptions of how I like I'm an evil Jew and I need to be like yeah, and I need to be completely destroyed and then like and very, yeah. very vivid descriptions of uh, or like posts of graphic Holocaust pictures and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so it's like when I deal with that stuff, the like shit that I hear most women complain about, um, like getting a dick pic, I'm like, bro, I wish I would get dick pics instead of that shit. <laughs> like, yeah, and I realize, I my... yeah, and I realize how toxic that idea yeah. is in comparison because it's like suffering's relative you know and all that kind of stuff but it's still it's like frustrating i have my dms closed on um twitter and on discord for a reason and that's probably the reason i still get added um with like graphic pictures sometimes um uh um but at this point i think i'm i'm pretty desensitized to a lot on the internet um, uh, I, I, there was like a week where somebody kept spamming gore at me every time I tweeted. Um, and you know, obviously there's like, obviously the street shitter, like, um, comments that people make towards me. Um, but like at the, what frustrates me more is when it's people who are supposed to be on my side, who are holding me to a different standard than they would to any male creator. So if any, any other male creator were friends with somebody, um, like flamenco or friends with anybody else or friendly towards somebody. I don't feel like that they would be being characterized as a Nazi or a fascist as often as I am. I also feel like um, people don't underestimate those those creators um, as much as they underestimate me. They automatically assume that I'm an idiot, that I'm dumb, even though I've had like more education than most people I interact with online. Mm -hmm. Um which is incredibly invalidating, you know, like what, what was the point basically? But, um, uh, they, they, it, I, it's just the invalidation of the amount of work that I put in the amount of education that I've sought out the amount of, um, hardship I've gone through in my own personal life. Um, and people just, um, they just make assumptions about like what I'm capable of and what I'm not capable of. And I feel like if I were a man, maybe they wouldn't be doing that as much. 
So you're honestly probably correct. I would say on this, like, uh, like honestly, like even other women, I, I probably participated in myself, like even in this conversation, um, with how much we talked about Mr. Girl and Flamenco. Um, it's like, there's probably like implicit, I don't know if it's like internalized misogyny or something. Um, uh, I know that, uh, it was just, it's something that I dealt with a lot. Like when I first entered the space, everyone just automatically subs- like subscribed me completely with doobie. Like they would just mm-hmm. and assume that I had all the exact same, same opinions. And, and this is something that I try to say on Twitter as much as possible is that like, you never want to come down. You'd never want to come to any firm conclusions about someone or their character, um, based on who they associate with, because, you never know what's going on behind closed doors. Like you never know the dynamic of of that relationship. You never know like if the relationship is even genuine. Um, Like for all I know, I mean, this obviously I'm just, this is, we, I don't know this is true. This is just something I'm making up in my head right now. But for all I know, Mm -hmm. Flamenco um, has, is blackmailing you with nudes. And so you have to, you like, and so you have to interact with them, right? Like you have to, like, there's nothing like, and, um, and I mean, even today, like we just found out that a lot of the reasons why you're, say, not as outwardly scathing um, towards very far right wing people is because you need to be careful with your words because for personal safety, because you're literally a woman of color. Right. Um, so there are like you just never know, like what's going on behind someone and what the relationships and why they're associating with someone um, and all that stuff. So it's like it's just an important reminder yeah. for myself and included. none of these people yeah. none of these people are deluded on the right like none of these people are deluded that i agree with anything that they say on the right they know that i'm a liberal they know that i disagree with everything but i'm not taking sides um on their infighting their infighting is so toxic uh i'm just not i'm not taking any sides on that mm-hmm. and i'm trying to avoid saying anything about anybody that would indicate that I'm taking some sort of side in that kind of stuff because they are so horrible to each other. Um, but, um, yeah, I think what, what bothers me is again, like just the underestimation, uh, and, and like if it were any other male content creator who associates with this people, these people, I don't think that they would be like saying that they, um, they, that, you know, that they hold all the same beliefs. Right. Um, like, uh, Flamenco and I actually started off hating each other. Um, we, we like had so much vitriol between the two of us. Um, uh, and so, um, I think uh, some of our earliest interactions was us just yelling at each other and calling each other names. Um, but, um, we ended up being like friendly later. Um, but like uh, any other content creator, I feel like a male content creator, like Chud Logic could be friends with like Mr. Girl. Right. Um, and, and nobody has any delusions about child logic agreeing with everything that mr girl says right i Um, I disagree with you there because i think chud i've like i think i've heard disagreements with chud the way chud platformed mr girl um and uh and the way he kind of downplayed stuff but he also um was constantly pushing back against mr girl and he didn't call like mr girl a good person and and all that stuff it's the same thing that of the criticism that i see against destiny with lauren southern where like Mm -hmm. the criticism seems to be on like how like he is and he's getting a ton of pushback right now from his own community from dgg like about um how he platforms lauren southern and how like and they feel like he's doing it in response irresponsibly um Mm -hmm. so i do feel like other male creators do do get some of it too. I I'm sure they do. Um, I just don't think that people underestimate them as much as they underestimate me. Like one of the main things that people say about me is that I'm dumb, that I don't know what I'm talking about, that I've done no research, um, which is very irritating because like, um, like I'm a research junkie. (laughs) Um, uh, it's just, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that the fact, why did I spend years in, in education to, to be questioned so much like this, you know? Um, but it's just, what um, did you study, by the way? um, well, I, I initially, st- I, well, I'd rather not talk about it, but, oh, um, sure. but, <laughs> but, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I got my bachelor's in music and then I was pursuing a post 
post back degree um, before COVID hit. Um, but I have a significant, and it, the post back degree was in a different area. But um, but you know, I have a significant amount of education, um, like well rounded education. Um, and so the fact that people just automatically assume that I'm like dumb is uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's because I use a uh, and I use like in a lot of my sentences, which I'm trying to cut back on. But I don't know. It's 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 frustrating. I feel I I put so much work into this stuff. I read books like off stream about content and not content about um, subjects that I'm focusing my content on, and um, it's just frustrating. So it's okay. I get called dumb too. Um, yeah. My uh, my family literally said that I was a useful idiot for the uh, for the anti-Israel Palestinian side. That's what they mm. they're using you as a useful idiot, so you can be their token yeah. Jew. So. Yeah. Here it is. Naive ten year old right now. Yeah. Naive ten year old. So um. Yeah, I think I I think I do get. I, I, people don't realize the amount of vitriol that I already get from like from specific communities. I spent like a whole week getting hate rated by um by like groupers um uh and it wasn't just like a, a normal hate raid. It was like the first day was like two hundred some people, and then after every day after that was like fifty people hate rating into me. Um, so um, it, it's not like. Be really really hard to deal with oh it was what very stressful it? um i was very burned out after that um but uh i have gotten um i've gotten rape threats i've gotten death threats i've gotten um uh i've had people send pictures um of just like disgusting stuff to me um i have my dms closed for a reason uh so uh, it's not like i'm 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 not I don't know what I'm getting myself into. I do know what I'm getting myself into. I am very well aware of the risks with it. Um and I um you know, I've I've seen some of the repercussions with it. Like it, it, you know, again like my the hate rating was specifically intentional to get me in trouble and to take away my income, right? Um that's like the purpose of a lot of hate raids. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's not like, I don't know that I'm entering dangerous territory anytime I enter any of these spaces. Um, it, it's just, um, it's just frustrating that so many people like seem to think that I don't know what I'm doing. So from what I'm understanding is you feel very underestimated, like, around the world and you've basically been underestimated your entire life like that's the mm -hmm. impression that I've gotten um and like and because of that you connect to people that are ostracized and you just naturally kind of it seems like you just naturally want to talk to people and uh and, and enter a world like when people tell you, you can't do something it makes you want to go talk to them and talk to those people more right like you don't like being controlled yeah. yeah i think that like for me that makes a lot of things make sense right especially like when you like i put that in perspective with everything else especially when you consider how much of this space makes you feel as a content creator makes you feel like you're being constantly controlled it's like if you particularly have an issue with being controlled, it's like the space is probably constantly triggering because um, it's all everyone's always telling you what to do, especially mm -hmm. as a woman. Mm -hmm. So like where where do you plan? How do you want to grow your content in the future? Like where do you plan on kind of um, like taking taking your channel and um, and what do you plan on doing as a streamer like in the next year? I think I'm I'm just going to continue to be more and more honest about my views on things. I think like for example like my my anti-religion takes have been a hit recently. I think a lot of people like that. Um uh like why I view things the way that they are. Like um uh my my 
I'm just going to be, I think, more honest about like things that I that I dislike and and stuff like that. Um, generally, I try to be pretty polite and be pretty um, uh, optical, especially being a woman in like media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, you know, um, people view you differently. People view you more critically. Um, and, uh, and you're kind of expected to be more polite. Um, I'll still be polite, but I'm probably going to be more blunt about a lot of things. Uh, one thing I recently realized is if somebody threatens me or, or says something really disgusting to me, I think I have the right to say something disgusting back to them. Um, uh, at least in certain communities, not in the politics community, but, um, yeah, I'm probably going to just continue being, uh, you know, more blunt, being more honest. Um, and continuing to have meaningful conversations with people and connecting with people and, and asking uncomfortable questions, making other people uncomfortable. Um, and I hope to inject some humor in all that as well. So it seems like you're going to double down on the refusing to be controlled thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, is that a good summary? Uh, yeah, probably. That's probably a huge part of it. So. I think that this is a good thing for, especially for people who are watching. Um, if for the for those, I know there's tons of people who are watching who are huge fans of you. But for those, for the for the few that are not fans of Stardust um, or are very critical, I think it's a reminder of how, like, how to give criticism as well. Like, even if you think that Stardust like deserves some kind of valid criticism, um, like there are effective ways to do that and there are not effective ways. And just telling someone point blank, you can't do this or you're a shitty person for doing this and that's it. It's like for someone like you, Stardust, like that is not the way to get through to you whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yeah, Moralizing. And it just has the opposite effect. Yeah, trying to put like some moral weight on the fact that I talk to people who are different from me is not going to work with me. Um, I've been ostracized my entire life. Um, I know what it's like, and I'm not going to, I'm just not going to like kind of give in to that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm willing to take criticism. And I'm, and I, and I think you'll find that I often disagree with the people that I interact with on a frequent basis, um, on a, on a variety of subjects. Um, but if you only view me as like this one dimensional character, uh, I, yeah, you're going to think that I, I, I roll over for everything. Like, of course you are, I guess, uh, like view me a little bit more with a little bit more color with a little bit more dimension, I guess. Um, I have a, I have one, first of all, I completely agree with what you just said. I wish in general, we would all see each other as like complex human beings. Um, and I feel like even I get into the trap of like the culture of just almost objectifying other public figures into mm -hmm. like, they're like a political opinion instead of just a human being with flaws and, um, and their, and their own story and stuff. So it's a good reminder for us to not objectify one another. Um, like that and for the audience not to do that too um, but I have one last like super serious question um, do you believe that it's ethical to pee in the shower I think it's morally neutral I personally don't no, do it what the I That's think it's ridiculous. morally I think it's morally neutral I personally don't do it because I it just doesn't feel right to me um, yeah so it doesn't feel like natural, you know. I it feel like feel natural feels wrong to me. Yeah, you do have a vagina. I'm I'm guessing, right? Yeah. So, um, like I didn't want to make any assumptions, but I was pretty sure. And yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, peeing in the shower with a vagina is just not a it's a losing game. <laughs> like you're gonna spend more time in the shower. I've never yeah, done it yeah. myself, but I would assume so based on physics. It's, it's not, yeah, I just can't do it. It's, it's, I'm physically incapable of doing it. There's like something in my brain that makes it incapable. Okay. Um, would you, yeah. would you be okay with like, say like you had like a boyfriend and he peed in your shower? Would I probably wouldn't okay? like it. I probably wouldn't like it. So um, you do, you, you don't think it's morally neutral. Like you would say that it's. I think it's other people in other people's houses can do what they want in my house. I don't want it in my shower. Uh, cause you know, like what if the pee is like, not go, does not go all in the drain and then, like, you know, 
feel like yeah. you're being a little weasley here. Like, I feel like you really like, you know, like, you know, it's wrong. And that's why you don't want it in your shower, but you're okay with people dirtying their showers. Well, I think, you know, what other people want to do with their lives is, is up to them. And I'm not in their shower with them. Oh, you sound like a lib. Um, I am a lib. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What other people want to do in the shower uh, is their business. But I'm not, not in, in your shower. shower with them. Not in my shower. No. I I heard that like all men pee in the shower. So, and that just made me, I was like, okay, I'm just going to only date women because of what the fuck. Yeah. I guess I'm never dating a man again. So, um, yeah, peeing in the shower is disgusting. Um, people who do it uh, should be executed in Minecraft. Okay. That's my, my very yeah. hot take. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, Stardust. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to this. I know we went through some really tough questions. Um, and, uh, like, you are honestly, like, your work ethic is so admirable. Um, and I genuinely think you are so insanely brave. Um, I, we didn't really get it, get a, a chance to get into the Amber Heard stuff. Um, yeah. But, like, honestly, you gained so much of my respect for, for that. Um, and, like... Even if I disagree with you sometimes, it's like your heart's there, your mind's there, and you're authentic. And like those are three things that I can't say about a lot of other people in this space. So um, yeah, I uh, I think people, if people have criticism for you, I think people should be like a little more charitable. Um, and uh, yeah, and just kinder. Like I don't, I you seemed really hurt that night, um, like Friday night. And Mm -hmm. it just like when you said that you were heartbroken, my heart just completely melted. I remembered watching that. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. And I hope other people can have like some empathy for, you know, just even if it's understandable why Keffels felt uncomfortable. Right. But like Mm -hmm. just the way it was done and stuff, why it can feel shitty, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, like I have no I I don't I don't think anybody needs to do what I do. Um, Like I'm definitely a crazy person. Um, and nobody has to associate with me if they don't want to. I just, um, I just wish that there were some more charitability, like towards why I do the things that I do, even if you don't interact with. I really appreciate you interviewing me yours. Um, uh, and, um, uh, it makes me feel like I've, um, achieved something now to have been interviewed by the great heiress. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I mean a lot, especially with the my lack of streaming. But um, well, I feel like I feel like you know you you've achieved something. You've like you know that you've hit a certain milestone once Eris interviews you. You know, it's kind that's of cool. Like, yeah, that makes yeah, me feel kind of nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely yeah. think no, you it have. Is a milestone. Like, so. I mean, everyone knows who you are, and uh, you're one of the most visible women of color in like the space. And um, probably because I'm the only one, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um and uh i like uh yeah i i don't know i i think it's um it's just crazy to see how much like you've grown i still remember like you being just like a, a measly little panelist on a prime panel and mm-hmm. um getting talked down to I you know, it's funny because that was after that was still after I had been arguing with Muslim fundamentalists and for some reason I was I was in this new space and okay with being talked down to. Um, so it's, it's interesting how yeah. that works. But yeah. And now look how successful your stream is. Um, so, and you literally are talking to like pretty famous fucking people, even if I hate them. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I think that that's cool. Um, and I just love seeing women with diverse opinions. I love disagreeing with people. It's like, like yeah. with, I don't know. It's just, I just wish we had more, people talk so much about diversity, but diversity, like it's not, it's not just skin deep, right? That's important too, but I just wish we had more diversity of general of thought. Um, I, I love that you end up right wing on some opinions and you end up left wing on some opinions and center on some, I like, I don't know. I, that's, I wish we had more people who just wouldn't be so ideological. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on and, um, I hope your followers don't hate me too much for the, the no, harsh, harsh they, they like you. So yeah, they like you. Um, yeah. And my, and you know, my, my, my audience is very diverse. They disagree with me very often. So, um, Mine too. so I appreciate it. So yeah, I appreciate the 
disagreement, the constructive back and forth. I think it's great. Cool. Um, well, it was nice chatting to you, Saras. I hope you have an amazing rest of the day. And um, I hope you have a better weekend, end of the weekend, than the start of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And I hope you have a great weekend, too. Sure. Okay. See ya, Saras. Yeah. See ya.